Hello and welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumke here with Katie Coronado. Today we welcome one of the most influential voices on foreign affairs, award-winning columnist and best-selling novelist David Ignatius. For more than 15 years, he has published a twice-weekly column for the Washington Post, appearing in scores of newspapers around the world. He is a regular contributor to MSNBC and a familiar face in explaining complicated and challenging issues facing world policymakers. David Ignatius, welcome to Global Perspective. Thanks, uh, David and Katie. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, of course, I am so interested in knowing how you made the connection from going from journalism and covering all these hard news stories for years and then going into writing about uh, or writing spy novels. So I have a friend who said to me once, you know, David, the only place you really tell the truth is in your fiction. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not the case. But I, I became a novelist uh, back in 1987 because I had a story, a body of material about American intelligence activities in the Middle East that was so powerful that I'd already written a basic newspaper story. I couldn't find a way to put that information into a news story. And I thought, you're going to have to learn how to write a novel. Did, got rejected by everybody, finally got published, and that was 10 novels ago. And did you ever think that there would be conflict of interest, or is he really a journalist if he's writing about these topics, or even another layer of safety for you? You know, you, you probably had to interview people who, who may have been in controversial positions. So tell me about those thoughts while going into this. So I, I've spent a lot of my career in, in war zones, uh, in places where people were shooting at, at people, and so that's just part of uh, the, the world that, I, that I've covered. I've always thought your best safety uh, in any situation is to is to know the people who've invited you there and make sure they're responsible for your safety. That if something bad happens, it's on them. Sometimes you're traveling with you know heavily armed American soldiers, and and they're they're pretty reliable. In terms of the question of whether there's a conflict between my journalism and my fiction, I'd actually say that the two are reinforcing. You know that that like a structure, the two lean on each other and provide greater uh, support and stability than otherwise. Things that I find out in my, in my journalism that fascinate me, I'd love to take further, but it just doesn't work as a newspaper column and I don't know enough. So I, I take it into the world of fiction, I'll think, I'll redo it, I'll you know, disguise elements of it, obviously. You know, you promise people that things are off the record and they are. But I think that the two have ended up being supporting and not, not in conflict. Let me ask you this, because you, you, you're you a journalist, so the instinct is always to get the story out and to make sure people understand the story. Have you found that your novels get uh, deliver a message more powerfully than actually hard news-based stories? What, what resonates with people more? And I ask this because you've told a story, of, and it, it's well known that your, your novels have been read by the CIA particularly. So I think the wonderful thing about a novel is if you tell a story over a hundred thousand words, you can be faithful to the, its complexity. You don't have to simplify it. You don't have to cut corners. The great advantage of writing a novel over writing an opinion column, as I do, is that you don't have to tell people what to think. You can let them decide at the end of the novel in which the good characters and the bad characters each speak as authentically as you can present them, uh, let, let the reader decide. And uh, I love that ability to, to let the story be what it is, to create a story, but then let it, let it be what it is, uh, and, and have people form very, very different opinions about, about what it means. I'll often, readers will sometimes say to me, you know, I'm convinced that this character did this for such such a reason. And it, it won't consciously have occurred to me. But I always say it's, it's, their view is as valid as mine. This happened to my preconscious. I'm not aware of everything that produced a sentence or a character's motivations. And it's then processed in somebody else's conscious, subconscious, and they, they own it as much as I do. It's a great thing about reading is you own what you read. That's true, but we're also living in very unusual times, I suppose. Although throughout the history of journalism, of course, there have been times that Journals have been used to support certain issues or, or certain perspectives on things. But at this point in time, you have 
divisions in journalism, just as you have polarization in the political process. Is there still a place where the facts actually matter, or is it about more about the narrative right now? Well, I, I, I worry that uh, we do have competing versions of reality, especially of American political reality, uh, depending on what channel you watch or what newspaper you read, and uh, that should worry all of us. Um, a country where there are just two versions of the facts and two substantial uh, groups of citizens who have d different versions of reality, that country is just not going to work very well. Uh, so I think we do have responsibility in, in my business. I, I work for MSNBC. I think it's a wonderful network. But I, I, whenever I appear, I try to make sure that I'm speaking to people who aren't already convinced by one side in the narrative and that I'm arguing from a basis of, of fact and not, you know, assumption. Um, but uh, if over time we have these fundamentally conflicting narratives that don't overlap, I don't know how c c good citizens are going to make their decisions at the polls. And I, and I think uh, we're going to head toward a, an increasing breakdown of our democracy at the national level. It doesn't seem to happen at the local level. Local news coverage isn't crazy. You know, if somebody isn't picking up the garbage, you know, the people write about it and they get angry. If the school board isn't doing its job supervising the schools, people get angry and they, they don't. So uh, in, in a way, if we could take local and state government and its success, because it's generally doing a pretty good job, and project it up to the national level, for starters, we, that'd be a step in the right direction. Uh, speaking of the future of the country and specifics, how important do you think the um, Hispanic or the Latino community uh, is uh, to in, uh, in this big picture, um, coming you know election time or just in general? Um, when we talk about elections, we have a lot of connection with media coverage. So, can you tell me how you feel about that? So, one of the truisms for people who write about politics is that the demographics of the United States. Uh, as they change will mean fundamental political changes as well. And so we're becoming a more black and brown country. Uh, Hispanic immigrants are an increasing part of the, of the uh, voting uh, public. And so over time, that's going to have significant political effects. Uh, the Republicans have become a party that speaks in what sounds like anti-immigrant language. So over time, there are a lot of immigrants, children of immigrants, who I think are going to pull back from the Republican Party saying they don't seem to, they don't seem to want us. And, and there have been many Republican strategists, starting with Reince Priebus, who was the head of the Republican Party, was one of Trump's chiefs of staff, who've warned, be careful. The country's changing. We're in danger of becoming a permanent minority party uh, in the America of the future. And I think that's what sensible Republicans need, need, to, need to think about going forward. I mean, we just had, um, you know, fascinating elections in Kentucky where the Republican governor in Kentucky was, was defeated. We had elections in Virginia, traditionally a conservative Republican state where Democrats swept both houses of the legislature. Just over the horizon, uh, we talk now about a blue Virginia, uh, a blue Texas, I think, is, is coming. Maybe certainly not in 2020, but you know, by 2024, maybe. Uh, so th those are just demographic facts. And <clears throat> unless there's an attempt to suppress uh, voters and, and reduce the kind of natural flow of new citizens into, into, into voting, um, down the road, uh, the, the role that uh, Hispanic immigrants, uh, you know, some of, of our viewers today are going to play is just enormous. Let me ask, kind of following up on Katie's question a little, um, we're talking about changing demographics in the United States, but there's always the question of, for voters, you know, this, this show is called Global Perspectives. You know, you have a tendency, particularly with the current administration, to devalue international issues generally. Is there a disconnect between average Americans and understanding what that what's going on in the world is actually going to affect their lives. I'm thinking particularly right now of, you know, Iowa farmers right now, or you can you can name the group, but 
think Americans feel, uh, they understand that they're connected to the world. The, the polling numbers show that people still are generally supportive of free trade. Uh, I think that many Americans are frustrated by the wars of the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, they're, they're frustrated that we've helped other countries while things for a lot of Americans were getting worse and worse. And so there's a feeling that we need to take care of America as a first priority. And I actually agree with that. I, th I think that, that um, the solutions, the threats to our country and what we believe in aren't in China right now or uh, you know, in the Middle East. They're right here. And I, I'm concerned about China. I, I want us to be active and involved in the Middle East, but that's not the big worry. The big worry is that we have a political system that's broken, that our economic policies are leading to ever more debt. We don't seem to be able to solve our immigration problem, our, our, uh, our gun violence problem, our, you know, our health care problems. Go down the list. So our infrastructure, the country, in many parts of the country, bridges are falling apart. So we do, we need, do need to... to focus on, on things at home. I think um, as we get stronger as a country, as our politics comes back together, we'll then play more easily and naturally the role in the world that I want us to play. I think this retreat, this America first, basically go away. We're going to, I'm totally against that, but I, but I do think for now um, our biggest concern ought to be f fixing this country. Uh, how important do you think um, embracing the cultures that are already here uh, would be to, to fixing the country? I know you spoke about immigration and that aspect of it, but for example, we're into messaging, delivering mm -hmm. messages. Do you think it's important to, to reach those audiences maybe that don't, who don't speak English? Do you think Spanish language content is, is, a, is important, is something to consider in a, in a bigger way um, from your perspective? People will seek out the content that they want. There are Iranian language uh, cable shows. There certainly are, are Spanish language shows, uh, Chinese language shows. You go around the dial and you'll find all of our different populations, um, people who want to have that uh, native original language content can, can find it, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, I do believe that uh, the process whereby my father, the son of a, an immigrant born in what was then the Ottoman Empire, became an American, and my father became an American, and enlisted in the Navy during World War II, and became an official of the U.S. government under President Kennedy. You know, the flame under the American melting pot then was pretty intense. I mean, it, you wanted to be an American. He held on to his culture, his cultural roots, but he also became part of this larger country and he understood there's some certain basic American values, uh, tolerance, and he grew up every, say, say, the Pledge of Allegiance every day in school, as I did. So I think um, that's the trick, is finding a way to let people hold on to their, their language identity, their cultural identity, but also have that flame under our melting pot just hot enough that, yeah, I mean, we all do need to get the things that we all hold in common. And, figure out what are they and hold all. Th so I think that's, that's the trick. That, that's what's made us so successful. So many countries have not been able to absorb immigrants. Japan is a perfect example. Most European countries, they just don't do this well. And it's one reason we've had such success economically. So we're basically doing it right. Um, a part of our success has been making sure people learn in English to get along in our workplace, which is generally speaking an in English-speaking workplace. But uh, basically, we should understand we're good, we're good at, at bringing in people from other cultures. Let's stop being so afraid of that. Let, let me ask you, when you do look at, at, at the globe, and you, you look at, we just were speaking of immigration particularly, which is a, an issue that's, it's not a simple solution. There's a lot of elements to it. What are some of the other global challenges you see coming now, and, and should we be optimistic or pessimistic about those, and what are we missing as the United States? So let's be honest. The biggest challenge to um, my children and their children is uh, glo global climate change. The evidence every week grows that something fundamental is happening to our climate that is um, leading to changes in sea level, um, 
the ability of fish to grow and thrive in different parts of the ocean, the melting of glaciers and the polar ice, the consequent changes in sea level um, cur currents and all the things that currents affect, the weather that partly is influenced by, by these uh, uh, terrestrial or, or maritime uh, developments. And I, I look at my, my daughter, who's 35, and my granddaughter, who's four, and my daughter says to me, you know, Daddy, it's great that you're writing about the Middle East, it's great that you're writing about politics, but I'd, you really should write more about climate because what, in terms of what your granddaughter is going to live with, that's, that's the biggest thing. So I have to remind myself that she's, that's probably right. And I think young people, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, one thing I've noticed is everybody takes this issue pretty seriously. I think it's a mistake that Trump and the Republican leadership are making. Young Republicans don't feel very differently about this than young Democrats. I mean, they know this is their, their families, their kids uh, are going to have to live with the world that we, that we make. So that, you know, that's an issue that, that, that really matters to me. Uh, I think as climate changes, but just as we become one, one world, um, the rise of infectious disease in different forms, different levels of toxicity. We have uh, my this oldest daughter uh, is a doc. She studies uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis. We have strains of tuberculosis that have gotten smart on all the uh, antibiotics that we've used to try to kill the, the, the strains. So we have strains that are almost impossible to stop. And that's going to happen with a series of diseases where drug resistance, you know, the ability of the disease to fight off treatment is going gonna, is gonna to be double again. Not so much us, but our children and grandchildren. We've got to take that a lot more seriously. On these, these issues like climate change, I mean, there's been a lot of resistance to them, but you could argue even when you look at the Middle East, a lot of the problems are caused by, whether you want to say, resource use or climate change or the connection thereof. The idea of sustainability, is that a tough sell for the public or for policymakers? It's an enormously tough sell for the public because, uh, let's be honest, uh, human beings are selfish. We're programmed that way. We're, we're, we're kind of hardwired to think about ourselves first and, you know, the guy in the next village is and worry about himself. The problem with these sustainability issues is that my selfishness today is going to affect my granddaughter's life 50 years from now when she's, she's now four, when she's 54. So how do I get it in my mind that I should alter my consumption so that she has a better life? You know, I mean, my church tells me that uh, I'm a steward of, of God's planet and that that's just part of what I need to think about seriously. But even if you're not religious, I think um, this idea that you need to care about people and the world beyond yourself and your lifetime is something instinctively we know is moral. Very good. Well, I have a lot of follow-up questions about that. You talked about morals. So when you're given stories to cover and you, you really would love to give your opinion, how do you stop yourself? Because I know From, it happens because we are human, right? When we're writing stories, when we're interviewing people, we have our own uh, perspective, especially because you've traveled so much to do mm -hmm. so much international coverage. You know what's right, you know what's wrong. You talk about morals, about your faith. Right. How do you do things and keep your balance even though you know you want to say something specifically right. related to how you, how you learned? You so know. I think that's the most important thing in, in, our, in my journalism business, which is that you need to be open to the facts that challenge what you believe. Uh, we do have a natural screening mechanism. Psychologists call it confirmation bias, where uh, the thing that confirms our bias, that tells us we're right, you know, we, we select and we believe, and then we write a newspaper story about it. And the thing that challenges us or our readers we suppress. And that's that's dangerous because we're filtering out the very information that we that we need to know. So in my life as an editor before I became a columnist and now as a columnist, I always ask, how do I know this is true? So the typical reporter's answer is, I have three sources. I have six sources who told me this. And I, I've always said, yeah, okay, fine. How do you know it's true? How do you know, what documentary evidence do you have? What, because often three people, six people are wrong. Uh, and uh, you know, f further, I've always 
told my reporters, I want enough evidence that if we got sued, we could go to a judge and get what is called in legal terms a, a motion for su summary judgment and dismissal of the complaint. In other words, so obvious on its face, here are the doc documents, toss the lawsuit out. That's a very high standard. Um, in our business, we've gotten away from that, but I, th I think it's 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 a mistake. But the, the um, journalists need to be celebrated when they're truth tellers, not when they're opinion sharers or drivers. You know, if inflaming uh, a country that's already ablaze with rage is not necessarily good journalism. Speaking of journalism, quickly. What is your perspective on what's happening uh, throughout Latin America and particularly Venezuela and Cuba related to freedom of speech, freedom of the press? So I, I think as journalists, uh, as we demand freedom of the press in Saudi Arabia or Turkey, we need to take that seriously in Latin America. Latin America has a tradition of courageous, high quality journalism. There's pe people I've worked with uh, from all of those countries, uh, take Colombia in particular, people who risked their lives and gave their lives to tell the truths about the narcos in, in Colombia, courageous journalists. Um, and there are people like that in Venezuela as well. Um, my own feeling is that um, we need to be as a country more engaged in what the future of Latin America than we are. It's, it's too much of a secondary issue. It's too much driven, forgive me for saying this, on a Florida TV station, but it's too much driven by Florida politics. It should be driven by our national interests in a strong, prosperous, democratic Latin America. Uh, it should be driven by the, the broader interests that we have. And it's too often kind of left as a political issue decided on that basis um, with Florida as the primary driver. And, uh, you know, I think to have a, a strong Venezuela policy that helps Venezuela over time, not in a crazy way, but you know, in a constructive, sensible way, working with the rest of Latin America, should be a national effort. So, I mean, there's, there's, it's a fine line between meddling in someone's affairs and kind of encouraging good governance and some of the openness issues you're mentioning. Where have we gone wrong in Latin America and, and uh, elsewhere? We, Middle East, for example. On, trying to encourage, but at the same time, um, you know, between encouragement and... So it's obvious, I think, looking at our history, really since uh, the end of the Second World War, that the great temptation for us uh, is intervention, is uh, attempts to steer other countries um, without um, working with the, the fundamentals in, in Europe uh, which was on the edge of communist takeover, the Soviet Union had taken Eastern Europe. We had a strong, systematic attempt to help every country from the bottom up. The Marshall Plan is celebrated because it was comprehensive, because it took the political health of those countries seriously. And we, we tried to support sensible politicians. We didn't send, we had troops there after the war. We didn't fight battles. Was it, was it easier when we had a enemy, if you will, one enemy that was a little more easy yeah. to define in black and white terms? It was easier to mobilize people to support things like the Marshall Plan. America, after World War II, as now, wanted to come home. I mean, people were sick of war. People's sons and daughters had died. They didn't want to be involved in Europe. And we had a, a president from the heartland, Harry Truman, plain Harry Truman from Missouri, who said, we need to do this. We need to be involved. We had Secretary Marshall, who'd been commander of our armed forces. My father uh, listened to him give his famous Marshall Plan speech in 1947 in Harvard Yard. And the, the miracle that we should take and think in terms of our politics is the country listened and followed what that what was advised. That's it's, you know I, I have lots of speeches. We need the country to say, yeah, we're with it. Let's do it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us and sharing all your stories. Thank you, Katie. And thank you. Join us next time on Global Perspectives. Mm -hmm.